Hey, it's Greg from Scholar Farms. I'm super excited about this video. It's a series of interviews I did with really smart folks from the University of California system. I got to hang out at a workshop with them this week, sat them down for a series of interviews about drones and technology and different sensors for monitoring water throughout the state of California. Hugely important issue here in the state. And I thought you'd be really interested just to listen in and, and hear some of their conversations, some of their perspectives. And so with that, let's cut to the interview. My name is Todd Dawson. Uh, my current position is Professor Integrated Biology, Environmental Science Policy and Management, UC Berkeley. So the California Heartbeat Initiative is really about trying to detect changes in freshwater resources across California and really starting with the California Natural Reserve System where we have a variety of different kinds of hydrologic regimes, watersheds, um, places where water varies uh, in relation to both the watershed properties but also the vegetation. What we're really going to try to do is bring some new technology innovations to those reserves and try to produce some new data products that allow us to look both up from the ground using wireless sensor networks and down from the sky using drone-based technologies to sort of understand how water resources are changing through time and over space. So we've had satellite data for a long time. Um, now drones are coming on scene. What do drones do that satellites can't? They give us some real-time ways of collecting data. They give us resolution that we don't get from a satellite or from measuring things out in the field with a tape measure or even with a, a sensor that you can kind of deploy from your car or on a weather station or something like that. So the challenge of, you know, we got sensors in the sky, sensors on the ground. How are you going to bring all those data together? Good question. How are we going to bring those data together? Well, we'll probably use a variety of different sort of analytical tools that industry uses sometimes, and we'll probably have to invent some new analytics to be able to look at new data products, new types of, say, three-dimensional data, um, statistical methods, and probably models to be able to do some of the data synthesis that we're need, going to need to do. So phase one of the project is really, you know, starting with a couple of reserves, and then there are 39, soon to be 40 or so total reserves. Um, thinking about scaling that not just within the UC reserve system but how do these results then apply you know to continent or even worldwide? Yeah so really good question. We want to start with 10 of the sites that really span climate space and then once we get sort of a template for how that might work then we run and roll it out at other natural sites but we also want to incorporate the agricultural sites. Sites that are managed, managed lands where maybe they're doing agricultural treatments, grazing treatments, other kinds of things that are influencing what the landscape might look like and how the landscape and the water are sort of interacting. If we can come up with a template of using both natural lands and agricultural or managed lands, that could be applied anywhere across the United States, across other countries. So the hope is that we come up with a template that could really be applied many, many different places in many, many different times. I'm Peggy Fiedler and I'm the Executive Director of the University of California's Natural Reserve System. The Natural Reserve System is really uh, an extraordinary suite of protected areas. There are 39 in total and they range from coast to high alpine and from the deserts to our evergreen forests in the north. We have um, 39 reserves. Yeah, soon 40. At uh, soon 40. Yeah. And the reserves are managed uh, day to day by the nine general campuses of the University of California. And I um, am in charge of the system wide office and system wide programs that expand. Um, all 39 reserves and the nine campuses. So that's a, it's a huge area to think about um, in terms of managing. Uh, and so we're th we've been talking a little bit about drone technology. And so how do you think that drone technology might complement your work and, and your role in, in monitoring and maintaining these, this system? Well, drones are really exciting technology. One of the things that is really challenging for the reserve system is to operate as a system, and that, meaning that we really want to use all 39 sites and sites from our partners such as the National Park Service or the State Park Service to really set up a, a monitoring system where we can take a look at uh, existing baseline conditions of, of the environment, um, vegetation, um, our wetlands and so forth and then uh, monitor them over time both in the short and the long term to take a look at what kinds of changes we can see on the landscape. Um, and we can do this with drones probably better than much of the existing technology that is already in place. 
I'm Chippy Kislik and I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Sweet. And so tell me a little bit about your interest in research and specifically um, about the role of drones. I'm really interested in using UAVs or drones because I want to know how we can use them to study water quality and vegetation indices. So vegetation health and water content in vegetation. So this summer I'm planning to do a project in which we are calibrating imagery with drones and samples of vegetation to see chlorophyll content as well as carbon and nitrogen content. In the state of California? In the state of California. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about California, the issues facing California, and the role of technology and plant science and how that might shape the future of science in the state. Yeah, well we're coming out of a big drought and California has to face what it's going to be doing in the next decade with limited water resources. So one way that we can do this is measuring vegetation and seeing if there's uptake in water or if they're using water from groundwater so sources or surface water sources, precipitation. And one way we, we can do that is assessing that through the vegetation health. So let's talk a little bit about women in drones. So there's actually not that many women using drones. Um, it's mostly dudes. How do we get more women involved and why should they be excited about drone technology? Well, I'm excited about women in drones. We want to get ladies who drone in every language possible. So it's not just limited to English or Espanol. But we want more women in drones because women can do as much science as they want. They're extremely capable and only 4% of the population of drone pilots are women. And so we want to get more people involved um, and yeah, just Fly high. Yeah, get, get your map on. Get your map get on. Get your map on. Right. My name is Kelly Easterday, and I am a PhD graduate from the University of California at Berkeley. Just graduated. Just graduated. Congratulations. Thanks. And tell me a little bit about your research and uh, what you're interested in in terms of geospatial data. So my research is actually mainly his using historical data, um, but the reason why this is cool with using historical data is actually bringing modern ecological networks and ecological sensors into the modern data array and then using that to both hindcast and forecast data so that we can better manage our um, systems for a more sustainable future. So we're interested in plants in California. Tell me a little bit about how they've changed uh, historically through time and how it used to look like and, and kind of what factors we're facing today. Like what are the big challenges? So in California forests in particular, we have a really dense climate going on. We have a lot more trees on the ground than we used to have historically. Usually it was more heterogeneous out there. You would have a lot more species. You would have these big gaps and open canopies. Um, what we're seeing now is actually a lot more young trees growing up and taking up a lot more resources that usually there was a lot more to go around. Now there's less and less and that's led to a lot of these tree kills that we've heard about in the news, the 127 million trees that have died in the, Sierra, in the Sierras and broader California in the last four years. Um, and a lot of that is sort of, we're using drones and we're using remote sensing to understand the spatial patterning of all these tree die-offs and then understanding how our trees and our forests have changed over time. So why the young trees, like what's the big shift there? The big shift. I mean, why trees. are we seeing this shift in composition over time historically to prep? Um, due to a lot of different factors in California. Um, number one, climate. Number two, fire and fire suppression. 100 years of fire suppression has allowed a lot more young trees to grow up. And then the last is uh, land management and logging practices across the board that have sort of contributed to some of these densification patterns. So thinking about drone technology, satellite technology, you deal with a lot of different data sets. Um, what opportunities do drones provide in terms of moving forward for thinking about both historical research and research moving forward? I mean, everybody knows this now. I think drones, you can fly on demand. You get high resolution imagery at any time when you want it. You can a lot with the, with the newer technologies, especially sort of the um, drones that have um, obstacle avoidance, you can think about using those as understory canopy and then flying something on top of it too to sort of get this penetration that you may not be able to get with an RGB camera, but that you can do in sort of this scalar operations with drones. Um, and I think that there's so many opportunities that are out there within forestry and broader. So challenging question for you. Um, so I know drones are a fancy new tool and people get really excited about them. Are there any new questions that could be asked using drone technology or is it just supplementing existing questions that we're asking? Um, it's a good question. I think 
you know, drones are sort of the pie in the sky right now. Everybody, it's sort of the same thing that we've been dealing with, with people trying to understand forest change over time is everybody, their heads are in the climate clouds and those are not always the number one fundamental tools that you need to address the questions. Um, there are missing opportunities and I think a couple of those missing opportunities are these scalar operations in which you can start linking on the ground sensors with UAVs, with aerial image platforms, with satellite plot based platforms and integrating it from the field to the cloud. Yeah, so the future is really merging the data layers and trying to look yeah. at change detection by looking at multiple paths of data. And to link it back with the historical data, as long as we can elongate or lengthen these spatio-temporal records of what we have available for science, the possibilities are sort of limitless. Mm -hmm.